holiday at the beginning of Passover and there's a holiday at the end of Passover. So on the second holiday of Passover, at the end of the week where we eat the cardboard, uh, we had an infiltration by Palestinians. We had infiltration by Palestinians. Now at that time, there was, a, there was an electrical outage. So the terrorists went to their first point of light where they could see there was somebody there. They wanted to take hostages. So where did they go? It turns out that because of the electric outage, we have an emergency generator. And what they turn on is the children's house. So they went into the children's house. I'm not going to go into the whole story because that's a story in itself and it takes time. But as a result, the secretary of the kibbutz was killed after he managed to stab one of them with a screwdriver. Um, a soldier was killed, and a two-year-old child was killed. Now, when a two-year-old child is killed, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Yes. Now, this child was not killed in the crossfire. <coughs> he was not killed in the crossfire. He was killed because somebody put a gun to his head and pulled the trigger. Yes. This was not crossfire. This was murder. Yes. This was murder. And this is how these people act. These are our enemies. These are your enemies. Yes. These are every decent person's enemies. That's right. They put a gun to the head and pulled the trigger. Okay? And this isn't the first time it happened. In the, after the Second Lebanese War, there was, a, there was a prisoner released. His name was Samir Kuntar. He went back to Lebanon. And that was because he took a butt of his rifle and smashed a child's head in. And he's welcome back to as a hero. I want, you, I want you to understand. He is considered a Hebrew. He came out of Israeli jail because we're Jews, we're nice to people. We have like nice hearts, so they say. So they say, we're softies. Okay, he came out of jail all fat and well eaten. He didn't come out a skeleton. He came out with a university degree. And received, yeah, he has a university degree. I think an inter I can't remember, political science or something like that. Everybody in Israeli jail can go to college if somebody pays for it. You know, they have like an open university. He went back to learn. He's considered the hero. These are their heroes. This is who these people are, and I think it's very important. If I have the chance to come and tell you who they are, yeah. this is who they are. Yeah. This is a hero. He came, real hero. Yeah. Anyways, 1982. We'll get back to the wars here because we have lots of wars here. 1982 invasion went up to Beirut, um, and as a result of the invasion, as I said, 1978 there was a result. In 1982, the result of this invasion was basically the formation of the Hezbollah. You have to understand that around 1979, 1978, there was the Iranian Revolution. They wanted to export their revolution to, to the Middle East. Um, and so the Hezbollah was formed. Now you have to understand that when you're occupying foreign countries, not everybody is going to like you. And the Iranians hitchhiked on this. So they formed the Hezbollah and they gave them lots of money. And at the beginning they were very crude and they weren't they weren't, they weren't really serious, um, but as time went on, they became more sophisticated. Israel withdrew to something called the Security Zone in 1985, <coughs> which basically encounters all of this valley that we can see over here, to the Latani River over there, maybe about six or seven kilometers that way, parallel to the Israeli border, so we won't have terrorists sitting on our fences. Now, it shouldn't have been like that, because in 1983, there was something called the May 17th agreement that was signed with the government of Lebanon that was basically a peace treaty saying that the Lebanese government was going to take responsibility for what's happening in their country but for some reason it didn't work out so it's one of these agreements that we signed that there was no result anyways Israel occupied southern Lebanon patrolled it jointly with the South Lebanese army under a general called Antoine Lachad um, who was also from Arjayun and in the year 2000 because of, because of public pressure, uh, Israel withdrew in the year 2000. And the result of that, directly to us, was, was quite significant. Um, you have to understand that when there was a withdrawal here, the Hezbollah was on the fences. They were on the fences of the country. I would go, I would ride down to Matula, they'd be standing on the border fence with their guns and their uniforms, with their flags. And it's quite threatening because it's not we just want to kick you out. It's we want to kick you out and we want to kick you out of Israel also. That's, that's what they want. In addition, where that base is was also used to be an Israeli base. And that road curving around was the border fence. The UN came in, marked the border, and actually they 
marked it correctly. I'm not going to complain about that. Um, they marked it correctly. And the border was much closer to the kibbutz. You know, how long does it take for somebody to go from just slightly over this fence, climb up a little bit, and get into the kibbutz? It's a matter of minutes. Um, and that was the result of 2000. Um, as a result of that, inside the kibbutz, we have our own security team made up of people that were in the reserves, people that were fighters, and we're supposed to sort of give a first day, we're sort of give a first answer until the army comes. I mean, I'm 38 years old, I mean, I can't run like somebody that's 20, but I still, I still can shoot a gun. I, I can still shoot a gun, and all of us in this, all of this insecurity team still can. Um, what you have to, anyways, it was very tense up until then. I would say the army barely patrolled the border over here. The army barely controlled the border. In 2006 came the South, uh, what came the Lebanese War, and I'll tell you a little bit about life in the kibbutz here. Uh, during the South Lebanese, during the 2006 Lebanese War against Hezbollah, um, another group is coming. Uh, <coughs> First of all, the women and children were evacuated. I was here about for a week until I was called up to the reserves. I'm a paratrooper in reserves. Was. I was released recently, so now I'm at home a little bit more. Um, but one day out of nowhere, it was about two weeks after Gilad Shalit was kidnapped, a giant barrage of rocket attacks on the northern Galilee, a giant rocket attack on the northern Galilee, there was an attack, and as a result, the, um, they kidnapped, they, it was a diversion, they were able to kidnap two soldiers. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit of my experience as a soldier there. Below us, it looks nice, people, people are living. What you have to understand is that under these houses, I'm not making this up, this is stuff that I saw, okay? You have a family living in a house, women, children, grandparents, this, that, whatever. And underneath the house, there's a command and control center. It's a bunker, it's ammunition. And beyond that, the under the house, there's tunnels that connect different houses so they can like go in and run like rats. They could go from here to there without us finding them, and it was it was almost scary how much they they prepared for this. They were prepared. And I want to say something, because Bala, they're good soldiers. They are good soldiers. They are well-trained soldiers. And I'm going to get back to my Iran thing, and I'm going to tell you that they are trained by Iran. All the oil that Iran produces buys them weapons, buys them weapons. They are better. They train more than we do. They have more money than we do. They are excellent, excellent, well-trained soldiers, and they need to be taken seriously. Swindy. Mm. Oh, there's people living there. It's dead. Okay, I have a couple of minutes before the next group comes. It was a very, very traumatic war for us. Uh, inside the kibbutz, just alone, we're talking about 22 missiles just inside the kibbutz. The security team in the kibbutz um, was busy putting out fires because the rockets fell in fires. And, you know, we ran with water hoses to put out fires. I, in the first week, and then afterwards, I wasn't here. My wife and children weren't here. And uh, we were very happy that the war ended. <coughs> Not the desired result. I think the next time it happens, there's something that's a little bit different this time. It's going to happen again. Because now they have missiles that, that can shoot 350 kilometers well past Tel Aviv. We'll be relatively safe here because Tel Aviv's a big money. I think the difference is, and I hope that the government um, of Israel understands this, is that now the Hezbollah is in the government. They are part of the Lebanese government. And that's the difference. Then they were a guerrilla organization. Was it the Lebanese government? Wasn't it? Who was it? Now they're part of the government. Now the entire state of Lebanon is I'll just tell you a quick minute about the kibbutz. Um, we're privatized kibbutz. We're not completely socialists anymore. Um, we make our, we we prosper from cotton, from fish ponds, from a factory, from chicken houses, and from tourism. Uh, my name's Alex. Beyond Beyond giving tour talks here, I'm also a veterinarian. This I do for my uh, for my.
my own health. I think it's important. I also speak English. And that's it. Any questions? Just one question. Yes. How seriously are you taking this uh, threat on Nakba on May the 15th to, to stampede our borders? You know what? I didn't even hear about it. Well, now you have. Now I have. <laughs> I'm going to put it like this. I am not a person that likes war. I hate war. I hate killing. If somebody comes to attack my family, I'll put a bullet between their eyes. Amen. And that's it. Okay. And, and that's it. And believe me, I don't, I'm not a violent person. I'm the opposite. But if anybody was to come and threaten my family without thinking twice, in my particular, coming this way towards my family, they're getting a bullet between their eyes. Oh, on the bus. Yeah. And I, and, and okay, I hope thank it you. doesn't happen. I hope we don't get to that. We're praying. We're praying. Well, we'll pray on the bus. Okay. Thank you okay. very much. Okay, thank you, Alex. Thank you.